So um, our next speaker um, is Sarah Yo Johanna Torer. Um, Sarah is a curator and writer focusing on time-based uh, art practices and techno-social entanglements. She is a curator at Haus der Kunst in Munich where she has been conceiving uh, rich public programs and commissioning performances to artists such as Isabel Lewis and Christelle Oyeri uh, and works by Kasten Nikolai and Jena Sutela. Together with Andrea Lissoni, she co-curated a retrospective on Fujiko Nakaya and co-edited a comprehensive publication on the artist. Terror has previously worked at the 9th Berlin Biennale and Transmediale Berlin and with performance groups like Omsk Social Club and the Agency. So, welcome, Sarah. Thank you, hi. Let me just get the multi-screen setup started here. introduction. Thank you, Bettina, um, for the invitation. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I think I sort of want to uh, pick up um, a few of the thoughts that Karen brought up um, and also in relation to the, to the question um, that, um, that was posed last. Um, but I'm going to start, I think, um, with this notion of the um, sampling. Um, Michel Marieros has often been described as a visual DJ or um, his methods has been compared to sampling, as Karen, you also mentioned that. Um, bringing together fonts and motives from different cultural registers. Um, and I want to highlight, I think, that this, these cultural techniques, um, such as sampling and remix, they originate in the Black Atlantic. Um, and we should note that um, according to the people I spoke with also in preparation of this presentation, that Michel Mayors was not necessarily a raver. Um, but then it's curious that um, in talking about his work, we, we come across all of these um, notions like remixing and sampling. Um, so, yeah, I wondered, um, I wanted to go into this a little bit. Um, and also thinking about how these terms uh, coming from a music background um, contribute to our understanding of techno culture or cyber culture that um, we also find a lot of references in Mayers' work. Um, these uh, notions um, like sampling and remixing, um, they continue still to shape our digital or digital landscapes that we deal with today. Um, so, I found that the rhythm um, could be an interesting uh, way to look at Mayer's work and try to maybe find some order in what has been described so often as the digital chaos. Um, and I'm starting with this work that we already looked at, Beschleunigung, um, which was um, installed at the Munich main station in 1998. Um, I don't actually know how long it was up for. Um, I just kind of often think of this uh, painting, although I've never seen it, so to me it's really um, almost like a, like a memory um, that I've never experienced. Um, and I think it's interesting um, that this is a public space um, that I frequent quite regularly and I'm often exhausted actually wishing for more acceleration or for time to go by much more faster. Um, and this is not an exhibition space, right? So exhibition spaces often pretend to, to be timeless spaces. Um, and the train station um, is a very busy sort of like semi-public space and it's composed of many different rhythms that are unfurling in parallel. There's, for example, the intervals of trains arriving and leaving, but um, there's also the constant delays. Um, there are shops and sounds and smells that only appear in specific times of the day or in specific seasons. Um, there's the clock, um, which we can also see in that picture. Um, and there's the individual rhythms of, um, of people, uh, people's lives, uh, made of, of chance and encounters. 
Um, and they're all sort of like nested together in a spatial simultaneity and in a coexistence. And so Beschleunigung, um, it's situated in the background, um, but it's still quite well visible. And I feel like it really underscores um, these different rhythmic qualities of the, of the space. Mm, it's also directly involved in this discontinuous sum of visual contents that we can see. Like you see the, the advertising, the cafe cacao, and um, it kind of like works in a similar way as, as Karen also mentioned the Coca-Cola and the sneaker um, example earlier on. Um, so it's it's pierced into that wall, but it's also sort of it's it's part of a rhythm that escapes it at the same time, right? Um, and the it also has a rhythm in itself, like these buttons that appear quite often in his work. Um, they seem to like bend forward um, towards the viewer, or towards to the public, um, and they emphasize a sort of temporal dynamic moment of, of the perception of this work. Um, and they look a bit like, I don't know, like a bubble that's about to burst. Um, it also plays on these simple forms that we know from billboards, um, and, and it caters to, to like a minimal attention span. And we also see the Carrera race track um, that, that like reappears in his work. Um, quite often. Um, <laughs> I'm citing from a, a book that um, was given to me by Bastian Kronendorfer, who had worked with Michel Mayers in the um, past, um, or in the la last years. It's a book from 1995, and it's titled Localizer 1.0. <laughs> um, it was uh, handed to me with the words, this was some sort of Bible for the vibe and all. So I really digged into that book um, and doesn't actually speak so much about visual arts. Um, and between the many pages dedicated to Hubble sound and techno conscious and camouflage as a strategy, which is quite interesting, um, uh, motion graphics as well, there's one essay on art as contemplated in Berlin by the turn of the millennium. And um, there's this quote uh, that I'm just going to read. Here, we are talking about a new meeting of the aesthetic creation with the public. A meeting that doesn't require the full attention of the onlooker, but rather includes itself in a field of experience to which non-plastic elements, like music, nowadays the principal vehicle for a sense of life, the encounter with other persons, the movement, visual elements like light, lasers, etc., have to be included. So if we remember now the, the buttons of Beschleunigung um, that allude to somehow like rescaling or setting filter priorities. Um, yeah, he, maybe you can read it. It says like uh, priority um, and the, the other one it says like components and like a scale. Um, so this really speaks to a commitment to mediation rather than representation. And, and I would say this also speaks to Mayer's uh, embracing wor working and living in a mediated or fully mediated world. Um, 1998 um, was uh, still the, the dawn of mainstream internet, but um, I think the, we can see that or sense that the images had already started moving. Um, 1998 is the year of uh, hamster dance, the world's first meme, if I may say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and images are really no longer still on the canvas and, uh, or in the TV, and they are not switched on and off at will with the remote control anymore. And it's a very different pulse. So again, I come back to rhythm. Um, it's reported that um, since they were first released in 1985, I think, Marius walked around with a Sony Handycam, and he would just record and then f potentially filter later. And unfortunately, we will never know um, if he would have gotten around to sort out these materials that he had collected. Um, but I think we all know that it's, from our own experience, that it's uh, often unlikely to ever go back to all those recordings, uh, bookmarks, and screenshots simply because there are too many. Um, and we find relatable slogans, actually, in Mayeros' uh, work, like, it doesn't really matter what things look like if one cannot see them that well anyway. 
or not much is thrown away because there, because there are no places to throw it. They're both from 99, the quotes. So um, looking at the career race track um, and alluding to what Karen quoted earlier as like the chaos of the digitalization, um, the, the career race track and the beschleunigung, the acceleration, um, all of this has led to the to a reading of um, the data stream as the stimulus vortex um, and this endless loop that um, sort of unfolds but never really develops. Um, and one year before Mayer's created Beschleunigung, um, he held a lecture um, on Polke and uh, he talked about images and memory, which I think is, um, is interesting. So um, I included this quote here. He says, there is never a chance of suppressing the memory of an image. This is generally the case with the past or the ephemeral. The desire for more pictures becomes a flow of moving images. There will be countless images as long as there's a desire for acceleration. Whether it's a new picture or the repetition of the same plays a big role. And that's interesting in general, both have priority at the same time. So no, no camera, no image or series of image can show these simultaneous rhythms that he's talking about. The new pictures, the repetition of the same pictures and them having the, um, a priority at the same time. Um, aside from cameras or paintings or what have you, um, it requires attentive eyes and ears and a memory, and the memory grasps the present as it restores its moments in the movement of these diverse rhythms. Um, I think one does not merely read the images of Myers, but also really feels them, um, and that's something Karen had also mentioned previously, the installation part of it, like how you would walk over the um, floor that's installed and like hear the sound of your footsteps. Um, I think that all plays into the um, experience of the work. Mayuros writes in his notes, um, techno only works through an abundance of abuse bass rhythms. Abundance of serial work can be important again through an ultra large rhythmic production of 160 by 140 paintings. That's a very specific reference. I don't actually know what it refers to. Things quick, serial, and random will be an important trigger for me in the near future. The representational, which is usually surprising in comics, can be replaced by an extreme spectrum of versatility on the level of abstraction. The pictures mustn't appear too rigid. So here we're going back in time and we see again the Carrera Vortex um, race track and closing the word advance. Um, we also already see uh, one of these main principles, the reconfiguration of the same elements, um, what has been described as uh, techno um, when looking at Mayoris's work, it's the effects of digital working production. Um, and it's not necessarily just music, but this reconfiguration of temporal sequences was perhaps the most um, obvious in music, I would say. And time and thus rhythm of our life can be stored and stretched thanks to the computer. Speed and acceleration, Beschleunigung, is something that can be tampered with. Um, the boxes, um, and these are actually the titles, A127, T127, H127, and M127, have been compared to Warhol's Brillo boxes, but they're actually the size of the MacBooks that were sold back then, so they are 55 by 55 by 73 centimeters. Um, and in the line of logos next to the Carrera track, we find references to cover sleeves of Dave Clark's 1995 release, The Red Three, on the label Deconstruction, and Richie Horton's Plastic Man. I think what you can see here is really bad screenshot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and this might have just been, you know, common knowledge in like 90s Berlin. Um, but let's forget techno for a moment. 
um, and look at musical meter, so which is so closely tied to computer technologies and how it makes um, perhaps can make sense of this pile of boxes. Um, so musical meter involves our initial perception as well as sub subsequent anticipation of a series of beats that we abstract from the rhythm surface of the music as it unfolds in time. So rhythm we could think of as timed movement through space. Most uh, music, dance, but also of course poetry establishes and maintains a sort of metric level, um, which is a basic unit of time that may be audible or may just be implied. Um, so it's the pulse um, or as well the beat. So we have a basic unit, um, let's say these boxes, um, and within these boxes we, or on the boxes we see these logos, which are again sort of units and there are four versions of these logo sets. Um, so we have like different discrete uh, items um, that are recombinable at will. Um, and they're all, again, all these like rhythmic elements, they're like nested together. And in this case, they're accumulated and stacked. Um, so the beat uh, consists of these um, identical yet distinct periodic short duration stimuli um, perceived as points in time. And the beat obviously depends on repetition of a pattern that is short enough that we can memorize it. So here, for example, think of the brand logos as well. Um, the tempo of the piece is the speed or the frequency um, and this is measured in how quickly the beat flows. Um, we'll go back to the question of like the quick uh, beat later on. Um, we'll think of beats per minute as the um, sort of time that we're thinking in. Um, if the beat is too slow, uh, you don't really understand the succession anymore and um, the musical piece would become unconnected. If it's too fast, it becomes a drone or in the case of uh, my euros, um, this would be the chaos that people uh, spoke about. Um, with the next work, we go further back in time, but we move forward in my euros time because the series Space Invaders is from 2002. Um, as an historical artifact, actually, Space Invaders, uh, the, or the original software from 1978, um, is a game that's now uh, part of the architecture and design collection of MoMA. And it's a, it's a classic of the history of gaming, but specifically also of electronic interaction design. Like uh, many early games, uh, Space Invaders doesn't have a storyline, it doesn't have heroes. Um, it requires and trains skills in navigation, um, shooting or jumping or driving, in this case, mainly shooting. Um, so what do we train to navigate through in, with these paintings? Um, here we see uh, still, basically, um, of the game, um, which is, is an accelerating succession of pixelated, poor images in the form of prehistoric or tribal-like aliens. And one might want or not want to remember um, how tribals were thinking in the turn of the millennium, and I think they're actually coming back as we speak. Um, so let's think of this as a beat as well, right? The succession of alterations, of differential repetitions. Um, we see a determining rhythm that coordinates all these uh, different aspects. An early version of the computer game Space Invaders had a hidden feature or a bug, this is not decided, um, or still a question that's uh, in debate, that allowed players to double fire by holding the reset button while shooting. And my argument here would be that to my ears it probably doesn't really matter whether it's a bug or a feature of a system, um, but we'll come back to this later. These, these paintings are interesting because they're very unlike what we've looked at before in terms of my ears work. Um, they're black and white and they're sort of ecstatic. Um, silk screen on cotton, there's like no, no depth really, no depth of field um, to use the CGI term. Um, and I understand this, this work sort of imitates computer generated images and deals with, a, with this stimulus vortex, but the stimulus vortex becoming normalized. So it's like 
more sort of a gesture of annihilation um, than, than critique or distancing. It suggests a way to navigate the avalanche of visual contents and messages, short, basically shooting at them or maybe double firing at them. <coughs> While in the first work of the series, um, the rhythm seems to be quite rigid and monotonous. In the smaller versions, we see these curious snapshots. They suggest more sort of like a moving target um, in front of the lens or the eye. These paintings are trying to reflect, I guess, the fleetingness or the mobility inherent in electronic images or the virtual world. And I think what's interesting to note here, um, I said earlier, or I described them earlier as like poor images, with technological progress, um, images increase compression. They don't actually increase their resolution, but they become like less high res. For example, think of the history of the GIF. The way GIFs work was to identify repeating patterns and then simplify them. They introduced a specific animation style, short, continuous, soundless loop. And um, it's interesting to relate the GIF to Mayeris' work, I think, um, divorcing this pictorial information from source material and combining it with text and sound. Um, it's a lot uh, like what we've been looking at or what has been described as sampling in Mayeris' work. Um, the text and image combination has, so to say, a higher bandwidth to convey nuances and I think that's something that Mayeris was extremely keen on um, using or, or tempering with. Um, another interesting aspect of, GIF, of GIFs is that they're not so, um, they have this lack of authorship and that's something that I don't think we find so much in Mayeris' work but it would be interesting to look into. Um, anyways, today most of the GIFs are um, videos so I want to also come to speak um, of this one video work that Mayeris had made. Um, he created this work uh, titled Michel Mayeris in 2000. It's a looped stroboscopic interplay of light and image body typography, disintegrating the artist's name into what's been described as formless energy. Um, and again, I could uh, trace back the formless energy analogy into this uh, localizer book that I quoted up from earlier. I really see it as a study on visual identity actually. Um, so visual identity is the uh, visible elements of a brand such as color and form and shape which encapsulate and convey a symbolic meaning that cannot be imported through words. Um, the main goals here would be visual um, distinction and singularity but they, dis they appear distorted um, and multiplied. So um, in order to understand this work a bit better, I reached out to the motion graphic designer, Till Vanish, who had uh, been commissioned with the graphic animation. Um, what really makes this piece what it is, but maybe we take a look at it before I continue. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can see the um, repetitive and uh, different rhythms um, and how they're animating um, the image. It's a quick, it's a hard rhythm, um, alternations of, speaking of silence, uh, there's like outbursts and time appears uh, broken and accentuated. Um, the colors 
are soft and pastel violet and acidic yellow sort of like washed out or faded. Um, and we see these geometric figures, the triangles um, dissolving from grids and, and um, sort of a streamlined font that uh, suggests speed. There's a beautiful oral history piece by a sound archivist, Paul Paulun from Berlin, um, where um, an unidentified but apparently well-informed member of the 90s club scene in Berlin mentions um, that there were not so many people working intensively with video and projection, but Till, the person who made this animation, um, when Till arrived with his RGB stuff, we were all blown away. So this was like fairly new to look at um, at the time when the video was made. Um, and moving image, uh, Till Vanish told me, was uh, back then mainly used as a light source in the clubs. Um, and I'm citing again from this book, Localizer 1.0, the perfect interplay of light, music, and stroboscope breaks down the dancing mass into formless energy. Form and shape are avoided. The individual body becomes untethered. There was never a sound for the video, um, and this is perhaps also due to uh, Till Vanish never making sound for his videos, um, because they were intended to be shown in clubs. And he did say that he listened to music when working, just to get a feeling for the rhythm, and he probably edited this to like 180 BPMs, but sometimes the DJs would use the animated works um, and slowing them down with a mixer. Um, this was a commissioned uh, work, and um, Mayeris had delivered the um, colors and the, and the letters, um, and then the animation was done by Till Vanish, um, who had also worked on like bigger scale projects like um, the Siegesorde, the Victory Column, during the 1999 uh, Love Parade, which is where reportedly Mayeris uh, saw Vanish's work. I didn't find a picture, but um, the following picture um, was shared uh, with me by the um, Mayer's estate, um, and I want to thank you at this point for your support in the research process. Um, we can see here um, sort of the, an inspiration for the video installation that was um, to be made. Um, This was obviously, again, uh, not an exhibition space, but a commercial space, sort of semi-public, um, with a video wall that was most probably showing commercials. And this is the exhibition version, um, pretty close to the inspiration. We see, again, this very rigid grid that seems to be dissolved through the animation. <laughs> And I turn again to the localizer book. Um, it reads, I wouldn't like to give the impression of underwriting anything. I'm talking about a techno-social process in the course of which the discussion in between painting and no painting could be fully superfluous. I don't even speak of extending crusader-like the aesthetic experience. This is something almost fully achieved by publicity and social communication. So it's interesting um, that the, let's say, norm or aims for um, art production within this, let's say, techno scene um, would acknowledge the um, whatever marketing had already done or provided. Um, And so um, looking at the video through rhythm um, and seeing it as a cadence of uh, visual signals flashing before our eyes, we can understand really animation as a sort of formal strategy, um, transforming static two-dimensional images into um, objects or, or objects into motion and uh, playing with this illusion of life um, or abstract rhythm. I think... Um, the flow actually it really is important for the works, also for the paintings, um, because they help immersing oneself in, 
into this picture world, which um, I understand is what Mayuris is after. How much time a frame is held for, um, and how much time do I have to absorb it? Um, we can again remember what we said in the beginning about the rate and the tempo. Um, the frames per second can expand and compress time, and the rate at which you blink can sync or not sync with the rate that the edit is cutting into. And this video, I think, really communicates density just through the tempo. It doesn't have to do anything with the content. And it's perhaps easier to look at the content through memory, as we said earlier. Um, and it's interesting to note the painting on the right um, on this image is the painting series from the painting series MM, which is derived from screenshots of this video. So it's really the sort of like the memory of this moving image. Um, And I want to close um, with another example of this uh, serialized um, memories of an image, which is this uh, Pop is Terra, also a series. And um, we learned from uh, Bastian Krondorfer, uh, Mayer's late uh, assistant, um, that this uh, text was taken from a t-shirt that DJ Westfam had worn. Now, whether you know DJ Westfam or not, I think we could argue about um, if Westfam himself was pop or mainstream. But here I want to come back to the double fire function and the question of the bug and the feature and it's why maybe it doesn't matter. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's one of the many offhand remarks that turn into catchphrase. Um, and it's perhaps part of what Jordan Wolfson had described as this cultural unconscious in the, com in the Moose conversation I've been uh, mentioned earlier. The bug or feature discussion reveals this ambiguity that has always haunted computer programming and thus also the computerized mass culture. We feel it reverberating in Mayero's work too. Another way we can put this is the polyrhythm of the painting at the train station. Depending on preferences, um, my years work could look or feel like a bug or a feature. It could be painting on steroids, but a bug could become a feature, something desirable, a shortcut, a cheat, like the double fire function. It just works. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think this analysis of uh, Majerus's work uh, through the lens of rhythm is like super original and fascinating. And um, uh, linked to that, actually, I was wondering if you could maybe um, identify different rhythm uh, throughout uh, Majerus's practice or like 10 years uh, career. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, thank you. I, um, yes, I think so. Um, I saw the exhibition at KW that just opened um, with the early works, um, which also draw a lot on animation and like comic, like um, early TV animations. Um, I mean, now I have to be a bit careful. <laughs> I think the the um, early work is in a way more rigid um, and has more um, slower rhythms. Um, then comes a period where, there, where there's like a lot happening. <laughs> and then again, we come to these like more simple or slogan-like uh, works. So I think, yes, there might be something like a, like a rhythm that can be traced throughout the whole oeuvre. <laughs> Thanks. Any question in the audience? Uh, where? Sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> Good. 
thank you for your presentation. Can you go back to this picture? I didn't get what it is. Uh, I don't have my glasses, so I don't see exactly what it is. What, which one? Uh, the, the one on the black and white. No, no, the, the last one we ah. where you, we were. Yes. Yeah. Ah, this yeah. One. What is it? Uh, this is a screenshot. Uh, it's really hard to read. I'm really sorry. This is a screenshot of um, a documentation video um, on Michel Marieres, and you can see here a photograph of DJ West Bam okay. wearing a T-shirt that says "Pop is Terror." So this actually happens quite a lot, and also from early on in Marieres' work that he would like um, repeat uh, things that he finds somewhere, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I saw in that KW exhibition how he would like take photographs of his paintings and then like bring them back into the paintings. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, this was sort okay. of the idea to give this direct reference. And what the date of this painting? Sorry? What is the date of this painting? Oh, sorry. I think it's, I mean, could you check? Um, it's 2000. <laughs> okay. So and you're it's saying a series also of paintings. There's like... I don't know how many of them, yeah. like a lot, 30 maybe. So you s you're saying something interesting that, you know, we understood that it didn't really matter as long as he was working in the painting, you know, what kind of slogan he's using. So this is obviously a very political one uh, that is interesting in this context of music where you use these kind of slogans and you don't mean it, but you mean it at the same time, I feel like. And, um, and Karen was saying in the... Um, in the early pr 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 um, presentation, that there was something more critical and maybe more political, uh, some kind of turn at the end of his practice. So we are in 2000, then we were in 2002 in the Brandenburg tour. Um, we didn't speak about any critical aspect uh, so far on his practice. Would you say there was something, could, could there be something uh, behind this uh, slogan here? Or was it just like really just an image? I think it's never just an image. I think it's always critical and joyful at the same time somehow, if that makes sense. I think this is what I try to say with this ambiguity, right? It's like bug and feature at the same time, if that makes sense. But there's also interesting, um, There's a, there was an exhibition, um, I only remember the, the German title, which was um, Sein Lieblingsthema war Sicherheit, seine These, es gibt sie nicht which was really drawing on um, a hacker, actually a quite young person living in Berlin, um, who had like managed to hack the telecom system and was in under very dubious and I think still uh, undisclosed uh, circumstances, uh, found dead, um, potentially murdered. Um, and I think, uh, so there, w there was definitely a moment when he like um, was more, political than in the works that I have looked at now in this um, presentation. I would also maybe just add because um, you were um, repeating that he was not a waiver, but obviously this uh, this whole um, scene uh, was was something he was relating to. So how political is it to actually m not doing it, but still it's a way of grasping these things and well, what do we know about him why he wasn't maybe at ease to go or was there and still he wanted to I mean he, he it feels like he's someone who is uh, obviously I don't know how we should define being political as being an artist um, but he is very close to his what was the world he was living in and uh, what, what what he was surrounded by so what well. Sorry, I think I didn't get the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then thank you in this case. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, thank you so much <laughs> for this talk. Is there any other question? I, I already have a mic. Thank you. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Sarah, so much. And also thank you, Karen, for your brilliant uh, introductions and curation of the, of the uh, arrangements of the different uh, body of work that you presented here today for the introduction of Mayeros at Muram. Um, I would like to um, make a, a little remark 
about the cultural unconscious that you referred to, place the contextualizing uh, Jordan Wolfson's um, quote here. And I would rather say, isn't it more like a hyper consciousness that uh, you are uh, witnessing here? Since um, maybe to study the electronic music, electron, uh, uh, techno culture is more than understanding surfaces or ego-driven celebrity culture, but rather go into a post-industrial condition of humans. And on that sense, I would like to raise a question to you and maybe to you, Karen, um, since um, the imagery that we see here is not only referring to a certain cultural fabric, but rather also focusing on, and not only male artists, painters, but also to very interesting male figures or male uh, animal personifications, um, since, uh, I don't know, a bunny or um, uh, a cowboy <laughs> or an mm -hmm. astronaut uh, in plastic or Mario, uh, Mario Brothers could also refer to a certain kind of um, yeah, ma reflection on masculinity that maybe you have also re reflected upon. And I was wondering if you have some thoughts that were imbued in your presentations regarding um, this aspect. I'll let you take this first, Karen, if you want to <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, I, I get the impression that he was really quite an introvert and um, and that also this was also kind of exemplary of his uh, interest in painting or in uh, gaming and that you know gaming uh, is a very solitary activity um, and I also was curious to hear um, Sarah Joanna speak m a little bit more about the stakes that he might have in raving or not raving I mean I for example work with you know, I, 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 there's a collection piece in the state of like that's about club dancing, and we've presented it a few times. And every time, you know, they always want to go to the club, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm 37, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, you can work with that content, but then what does it mean to actually have some sort of personal stake in that? And I, I think that if you have a kind of more introverted personality, then yeah, you're not always going to want to go to the club or you know, maybe you have a, a, a certain, um, yeah, you know, I, I also got the impression that, that Ma Majerus was not a partier, like he wasn't someone known to, to like drink a lot or do drugs. Um, and he had a very stable relationship. Um, so I think that there's something to be said about that. And what I notice um, about his kind of approach to masculinity that is that it seems very kind of c like conscious and very tender. And I think that maybe part of rallying against someone like Kippenberger or Baselitz and his very, very, very like specifically male history of German painting is also to think through masculinity. And I, I was just talking about this with my intern yesterday about how I, I specifically maybe have a little bit of an, an aversion to the, these German male painters. Like, you know, I, I can't even really say that out loud, but I just did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I really, really resent about some of this work is that the tension in that work is that there are these great male painters who express some sort of vulnerability. And that is seen as some sort of like edgy thing that a man would express some sort of vulnerability or femininity and um, or emotion. And then the count to, to counteract that sort of vulnerability, you see these extremely misogynistic and macho personalities in a kind of personal social scene like in Dusseldorf and Cologne. And I think that Majeros was completely the opposite. I think that he was someone who was very much more carefully investigating that. And then also as a person seemed to live a much more kind of like, um, yeah, uh, yeah, self-reflective life. I don't, <laughs> I, I'm thinking of what I, what I, what I can add to that. Um, I thought it was, um, 
interesting that in his notes um, he was like reflecting a lot on male artists, but there was not that many female artists appearing um, in his reflections. So. Um, yeah, I guess like Barbara Kruger or or Jenny Holzer could have been like references that might be worth looking into, and he probably didn't. Um, I think these. Um, I think there was multiplayer um, functions already, so I'm not sure if he actually played by himself if he were when he was gaming or playing. Um, I thought it was also interesting how Kerstin Starkemeyer described the work, or described not so much the work, but Mayeros as a user rather than a hacker um, or a programmer, um, which maybe goes into this direction of someone being a bit more solitary and um, rather, you know, digesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think masculinity was probably something that was like the the big like abstract elephant in the room that wasn't addressed yeah thank you okay thank you so much sarah